Welcome to the Ascends at Boston Avenue podcast. My name is Philip Boone, and I use he, him, his pronouns. And I'm Caitlin Drake. I use female pronouns, she, her, hers. Before we begin, I'd like to state that the views represented in this podcast are those of the individuals in this conversation and not the official position of Boston Avenue United Methodist Church. We're recording this podcast remotely from our individual homes during the COVID-19 pandemic as we practice physical distancing as a church community. This podcast is part of a series that will visit the topic of race and religion. We start this conversation grounded in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, Division 1, General Article 5. Racial justice, the United Methodist Church proclaims the value of each person as a unique child of God and commits itself to the healing and wholeness of all persons. The United Methodist Church recognizes that the sin of racism has been destructive to its unity throughout its history. Racism continues to cause painful division and marginalization. The United Methodist Church shall confront and seek to eliminate racism, whether in organizations or in individuals, in every facet of its life and in society at large. The United Methodist Church shall work collaboratively with others to address concerns that threaten the cause of racial justice at all times and in all places. In our Race and Religion series, our guest today is Laura Bellis. Laura serves as Executive Director of the Take Control Initiative, a health equity program focused on contraceptive access in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She is a community organizer and educator working across health, education, and social justice spaces. Laura earned her BA from Oberlin College. She came to Tulsa via Teach for America and taught junior high for five years prior to joining the Take Control team. Laura is deeply involved in the community as both a founding leader of the United League for Social Action, Tulsa, a research and policy focused grassroots organization working for transparency and accountability from law enforcement, an organizer with Demanding a Just Tulsa, and as chair of the Human Rights Commission of the City of Tulsa. Welcome, Laura. Hi, it's good to get to spend time with you all. I'm Laura Bellis. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Okay, so just going to dive right in, Laura. Um, In our last podcast conversation about race and religion, we spoke with Avery Marshall at OCCJ, um, and he helped ground us in some of our definitions and our understandings of race kind of more broadly. Um, But we're wanting to talk with you specifically around action, um, both locally and kind of broadly, um, and a little bit about whiteness, um, because I know that you identify um, as white. So that's a helpful conversation, I think, as well for all of us. Um, So just to start, like, you're a white person involved in racial justice work. Like, why? What calls you to, to this work? Yeah, I mean, one, I think, and this is from several years of doing the work and reading and listening and being active, one of my big reasons is just as a white person and acknowledging my privilege, which of course is a process over time and is ongoing. But with that privilege, I feel that if I don't do the work to dismantle white supremacy and the advantage that I've been given by the privilege of my skin color, if I don't do that work, I believe then I'm complicit in upholding white supremacy and upholding racism if I don't actively work to dismantle it. Um, And then I'll also add that, you know, I first kind of became cognizant and conscious of inequities and injustices that are experienced by people of color starting when I was in high school and I went to a diverse school right outside of Philadelphia and I saw that in the higher level classes it was almost all white students and then the quote unquote lower level classes were mostly students of color and seeing that laid out so clearly in classrooms is what propelled me into joining Teach for America and then that experience in teaching in a Title I school here in Tulsa really informed what I do now, which I just kept finding for my students that the disparities they faced in education, they faced in healthcare settings, they faced in justice settings, and just across so many spaces that I've always, once you have that proximity and once you see what people are faced with and all the systemic things that stack up against them, again, I feel I would be complicit if I didn't choose to act to dismantle that. And I think as somebody who had a similar educational experience, my high school classes were predominantly white and they were kind of those upper level classes. And then um, the population of my school at large was much more diverse than the classes that I was in. Um, Similarly, I went and did Teach for America. So I 
I relate to a lot of what you're saying. Um, I think kind of broadly, um, and you touched on it a little bit in your answer, um, but for white people just in general, um, why is it important for them to get involved and get hands on with um, some of this racial equity work? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because you hear the phrase a lot about how silence is violence or silence is complicity. And those things reflect that, okay, you should be, once you know and can acknowledge that there's systemic racism and that racism operates across a lot of systems and structures. And we also hold it inside of us as individuals, right? As white individuals, especially like we have prejudice, we have bias, it's there and we have to acknowledge and work again to dismantle it. Knowing all of that and then verbalizing it is one thing. However, I think then the bigger imperative though is saying something and not having action to match it is where you are just as complicit and just in some ways as violence so yeah, you hear the phrase silence is violence or being silent is complicit a lot when it comes to racial equity conversations, especially for what should white people be doing? And it sounds like when you hear that phrase, you should just be speaking out. However, I think it's really significant that people don't just verbalize that they acknowledge that there's an issue or verbalize upon reading and doing their homework that there's an issue with systemic racism it's morally imperative that we take action because if you know something and you say it, showing that you know something's a problem and then you don't do action paired with that and continue to actively take action, then you're just as complicit in that violence as if you hadn't spoken at all. Let's say you're one of our congregation members who has heard about the George Floyd killing or one of the other injustices that is fueling the Black Lives Matter movement and you want to do something. If you are just getting started, what do you do? Yeah, so there's a few different ways and kind of groups you can plug in with and get involved locally. There have been efforts um, for right police reform and accountability in Tulsa for quite some time, right? For really decades, this is a longitudinal effort as police violence and brutality. It's not new. We just, especially right now, as we're so plugged into being online and everyone seeing a lot of um, videos and content, especially because of the pandemic, people are becoming much more awake and attuned, right? This is something that has been pervasive since policing first started, which it has its roots, right, in people who are policing and capturing slaves. So um, what you can do, though, in Tulsa, and this is work I've been involved in for the past um, five years since Eric Harris was killed in 2015 by a reserve sheriff's deputy, there's a few different spaces, right? You have, there is the need to hit the streets and take action and disrupt things. And right, we're seeing people gather and have rallies and take over highways. All of that's important, and it has to be paired with ongoing pretty gritty and granular work that is the everyday work that's needed, which is there are groups like the one I work with, the United League for Social Action, where we focus on research and policy. Part of that is paying active attention to what's happening in city council, not just their main meetings, but their committee ones, to what the mayor is saying and doing and what policy looks like there. And in order to stay up to date with those things, what we do with the United League for Social Action, all capital letters Tulsa, is we're the ones that continuously look up what's happening, watch or attend those meetings, send follow-up questions to city councilors, to people in the police department, to the mayor, et cetera, to really be in the know and do our research and then look nationally for what are those solutions. So that's like active ongoing work that you have to persistently stick and stay and do beyond the moment of showing up for an action on, out on the street somewhere, right? That's important to do, but then it's following up with this consistent research and advocacy and accountability work. Um, and then there's groups like Demanding a Just Tulsa that kind of pairs some of that, okay, we have the research, we see what's here locally and happening nationally when it comes to best practice for police reform efforts, we're going to take that information, we're going to take action again, doing disruptive activities potentially, but then also following up as well with those elected officials and with those key decision makers to hold them accountable. 
And so the way that folks who are just getting started can get involved is reaching out to groups like that and going, hey, what can I do? How can I support? How do I join? Which I'm happy to share info about that to send out as follow up. Um, and then also you can choose to be that active, engaged citizen who's doing all of those things because frankly, what happens a lot of the time is it's the same eight to 10 people who keep reaching out to their city councilors, keep reaching out to this person or that person in the mayor's office or with the sheriff's office. And it gets easier and easier for some of those decision makers to tune us out. And so what's actually really key is we need a lot more people doing the research and doing all that outreach consistently writing and calling and showing up consistently being in those meetings and observing and listening. And a struggle is that people might start to be active in that way. And then when there's not an early on success or win, they drop off. And this work takes years. It's a long haul. And we need people who are going to show up and do some of that behind the scenes work that you might never get praised or acknowledged for, right? Just do that work and then do the follow-up with those officials to hold them accountable to making policy change. That's the everyday work that's needed and everyone can do that safely from home, which is the good news. So one of the things that I think folks are grappling with right now is, um, you know, we know that something has to change because clearly this isn't justice, right? This isn't just, this isn't right. Um, for people of faith, right, there's a sense that like, this is sinful, um, this is bad. So we can identify that something is wrong. Um, but I think folks are grappling with what are the things that can actually be changed? Um, you know, what does change look like? And I think with something like Black Lives Matter, where it's such a broad national movement, um, sometimes it's harder to think distilling it down to that local level. Um, so what are some of the, some of the targets that, you know, your organizations have looked at in Tulsa or what are the things that you've been tracking on a more local level um, that are kind of change, and I'm struggling for the word, but like those, those spaces where you're leveraging for change, right? Yeah, there are two um, big ones that are both part of national conversations and then have been part of local ones for quite some time and are getting more traction now. One of the big things is having not just adv community advisement of police, but community oversight of police. So not just having some advisory boards that give suggestions, which is kind of what's ended up forming over the past few years that very rarely meet and don't have a specific purpose or structure, but actually having a really intentional citizen oversight board that has, again, not just advisory capacity, but ideally subpoena power and real actual power to level out that power balance, right? It's one of those who watches the watchman questions. We know that the police are supposed to protect and serve and act as guardians of the community. We know that doesn't always happen, but what's tough is they have power, privilege, and a gun. Now, if there was a community body that also carried some power and again had that oversight ability and was actively getting data, actively able to review and assess data and policy, review and assess situations when they happen and not just have to wait for it to go through internal affairs, there that would really level the power structure in our community and build significant trust and is really key. And our communities had a proposal kicked around that's kind of lost almost all of its teeth over time called the Office of Independent Monitor, which is based off of a model out of Denver for community oversight of police, which includes data analysts and policy recommendations. And again, that community oversight element and monitors investigations as they happen in real time. So that's one big piece that could drastically shift what happens and be a mechanism for ongoing policy change in policing. And that would be huge. And then one of the other things is, of of course, acknowledging that police aren't the end-all be-all. It's really kind of like the hammer, right, at the end of a long line of injustices and inequities. And just in my experience as a teacher, and Caitlin, I know as a former teacher, you can probably relate. It's a job, right, policing, where just like teaching, you are asked to handle a lot of other things that you may not be trained to handle, or that there are other professionals who are better equipped to handle, like social workers. Police end up in those same positions, and then they have a gun and the ability to arrest and detain someone as well, which creates all sorts of downstream issues. And so 
if we see that police themselves are fairly downstream in themselves, right, they're dealing with folks on their worst day, they don't have a lot of tools in their toolkit besides force or imprisonment, that's not really a proactive solution. We need more upstream ones. And so one of the other biggest things we can push for is divesting from the enforcement downstream solution end of things and then investing in more upstream solutions like mental health supports. And that probably doesn't really sit with police, right? That sits again with social workers and a lot of other types of programming and initiatives that prevent people from ever needing to be in front of an officer in the first place. So those are two big local pushes, but they're also really reflective of what's being asked for nationally as well. What are some of the biggest areas of concern in Tulsa? So many. Um, Impact of chronic and toxic and ongoing stress that communities that are over-policed experience. And that chronic stress, like high cortisol levels in your body that are caused by that stress, actually can kill. It causes health issues. And how safe and secure people feel in their home environment and their community and their ability to work, play, pray, and just be safe with their family, that level of safety and comfort has a huge impact on people's health. And that's really one of our biggest issues as a community is that we have so many inequities across the board, especially that Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities experience in Tulsa. And then when you add on to it this layer of policing and the stress that that causes paired with environmental issues as well and the air people breathe that may be worse in some parts of town than others, all of that adds up to our life expectancy gap, right, that we see between different zip codes. And all of that is deeply interconnected with just the physical health people experience and the stress conditions that contribute to people literally having a shorter lifespan. There was a study that came out within, I think, the past year or two that showed in areas where there had been police violence, there were higher rates of maternal and infant mortality as well. That like Black women who are in communities that recently experienced some kind of police brutality or violence were more likely to have a maternal mortality or morbidity experience or have worse health outcomes for their child. So these things are deeply interconnected, and Tulsa has this intersection of all of those inequities and factors going on, paired with that we do have very high rates of police brutality and violence, as well as, again, maternal mortality and morbidity, and these things are interconnected and then impact people generationally because that stress just keeps getting passed on, and our city hasn't ever really reconciled or made reparations stemming, of course, not just back to the Tulsa race massacre, which we have never made full reparations for as a city, but going even just how the city was founded and that we're on stolen land and all of that sits with us and perpetuates. And again, that stress adds up and it physically impacts people's health in their everyday life. So I'm going to spring on a question that I didn't have on the sheet, but I'm curious. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what the Human Rights Commission for the city of Tulsa does and your involvement there. Um, Just because I think probably people don't even know that that exists sometimes. So what is what is that like? Yeah, well, I will tell you, we've been going through a restructuring over the past several years that was initiated before Mayor Bynum ever took office and is almost done now, where what's exciting is our city has Title V commissions, and those include the Human Rights Commission, the Greater Tulsa African American Affairs Commission, which is the most recently formed one, um, the Hispanic and Latinx Affairs Commission, the Greater Tulsa Native American Indian Affairs Commission, and the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women. And the Human Rights Commission restructuring was to now have a seat from the other Title V commissions, each have a seat on the Human Rights Commission so we can work more intersectionally and more impactfully. Um, And so that's something new that we're really excited to more collectively across Title V commissions be part of doing our core function, which is for all Title V commissions to advise the mayor's office and city council on matters related to human rights or the relevant topic of 
the commissions when it comes to policy, data, and all of those things. One specific thing that the Human Rights Commission is designed to do, and that we're just getting back in a spot where we're equipped to do it, and this is accessible for the community to partake in, is people can file complaints with the city if they feel that their human rights have been violated, if they've been discriminated against in seeking public accommodation or in a city service or space, people can file complaints and then we can review those trends and make policy recommendations. And then also for the small business enterprise program, which is primarily to ensure that um, small businesses, especially ones that are owned by individuals of color or women have access to contracts with the city, we can also specifically review and actually hold public hearings for complaints if people feel that they have been discriminated against or had a challenge in accessing those contracts. So those are our core functions and we're just getting back into a spot where we're really able to do that with the community. So these across these commissions that I was just describing, um, all Title V commissions, are really in some ways there to be a liaison between the city and these different communities that may at different times be marginalized for a variety of reasons. And the concept is that we're able to then help serve as a way for people to have their voices be raised and heard and impact policy that's formed. You were part of the team that marched in Tulsa a few weeks ago. What are the changes being asked for by the Black Lives Matter movement here in Tulsa? I'll just say, right, Black Lives Matter is definitely not monolithic, so I can't speak for all of the groups. Um, from working with the United League for Social Action and demanding a just Tulsa, the core focuses are things, like I mentioned earlier, around police accountability and oversight and really wanting to see that happen where citizens have authentic power. Um, one of the things that we were also calling for was an end to live PD, which has now happened nationally. So that's fantastic. Um, that was predatory and unacceptable to have as a TV show that was feeding off of people's pain. Um, and then also seeking justice for the families and folks who have suffered from police violence and lost a loved one, like Terrence Crutcher, Eric Harris, Joshua Harvey, and Joshua Barre, and really wanting to see justice, not just in a monetary form, but also in a policy form, right? That we need to see that policies shift to ensure that those things never happen again. And then also, as mentioned, divesting from the enforcement end of law enforcement um, and putting just more funds into proactive measures and mental health services, which we know are a significant gap in our community when it comes to service. Folks do the best they can, but we need so much more and so much more investment there. None of these are new asks. These are asks that have been in the works and in policy conversations with the city for the past several years and have just kind of, it's like get, your wheels just keep spinning you know, task forces get formed, recommendations get made, but the actual policy that we know is best practice keeps being delayed. And justice delayed is justice denied. And so people, part of why it's to the point where people are taking over highways and out on the streets and you, there may be things that people perceive as you know, violence or property destruction, part of why that's happening is that people have been asking for many of these things for decades. They've watched their parents ask for these things. And then on the city level, there have been a lot of false starts and promises made. And then the policy just peters out and um, forces like the police union here that has a lot of, frankly, outsized power, um, you know, is Organized labor important? Yes. Is organized labor for folks that have guns and police other folks important? To me, I think there's some real issues there and they have outsized power and they're very, very good as an organized group at getting not just hundreds, but sometimes thousands of folks to write an email and call city councilors against police oversight measures. And that's part of what has impeded some of these policies from happening and part of why we know it's important to take the sometimes disruptive action to get other folks' attention so they can start pushing for these things too because it's going to take a lot more of us because what many of us have found for the past few years is when it's our voices on repeat, eventually we start getting tuned out so we need other voices. Many of the folks in our audience um, either have a connection directly to our church um, or just kind of more broadly the Christian faith. Um, and it's an important part of how they just operate in the world. So how has your faith personally um, shaped your involvement in this work or how you view this work? 
Yeah. So I'm Jewish. And for most of my life, that's been a fairly secular part of my identity. Um, granted, though, a lot of Jewish values have to do with working to repair the world and do things that are really compassionate. So that definitely informs why I feel this work is important. But more so, I think I'm driven by my Jewish cultural identity, which as a kid, I grew up just fascinated by the long history of Jewish people constantly being forced out of spaces and never really having a permanent home. And there's always that kind of feeling that's carried generationally of, will I get out soon enough? When will we be forced out? There's just that constant history there. And I was fascinated as you know, a kid and a teenager with the history of right, one of the world's genocides, the Holocaust, and how people can commit such significant atrocities and evil against other humans. And then how others, um, there's a book called Hitler's Willing Executioners about what the average German did during the Holocaust and how truly complicit a lot of folks were who may never have wanted to admit it, oftentimes just by kind of not taking action or by being silent or even doing things that endorsed or supported the Nazis at the time. I, I was always so fascinated by that and wondering what would I do in one of those circumstances? What would I do if I had to hide someone? What would I do if genocide was actively happening in my community or world? And what would I do to protect people that may not have my identity? And here we are today faced with many of those same circumstances, right? We have people who have been imprisoned indefinitely at our border while they seek asylum, right? Children. Um, we have what in some ways can be considered an act of active genocide when people are consistently brutalized and denied resources um, for their skin color, right? We see that happening to our black community where if you're denied healthcare, if you're denied access to fresh food, if you're denied access to safe and secure housing, like there's all these things add up and are in themselves are a, a form of a genocidal act. And so I sit there and think about what has happened in history to the people that I identify with to Jews and see when I see the same things happening to other communities, then I just feel called to act. And that's really a lot of what informs what I do. And I think some people might see that as an act of faith in some ways that I just believe and feel morally obligated to do for others what I would hope someone would do for me and what I wish had been done more when Jews were persecuted and during the Holocaust. Um, and that just really informs the work that I do today and why I feel the moral imperative to do something when injustice is present. Because uh, again, to, to another quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I'm glad that was chalked on the side of a building downtown the other weekend. Is there anything else you would like to add? I think it's important to also see that the health disparities that are being magnified and the inequities that are being magnified by the current pandemic are interwoven with all of these other injustices and inequity and inequities and all of those issues and that the policies that our elected leaders choose to make or not make when we think about who is more impacted by the pandemic and the communities that are forced to work in dangerous conditions right now, or the folks that are going without healthcare right now. When we think of all those things and we think of the leaders who choose not to make policies that could save lives, then we also need to further hold them accountable because they're being complicit as well. And they have blood on their hands. And I think we have to acknowledge and see that for what it is. Just because someone's several steps removed from what actively harms or kills another person, if they had their hands in the policy, then they're complicit in it. And we, as people that are conceptually able to take action, able to vote, able to hold our elected officials accountable, we are also complicit too if we don't choose to hold them accountable, if we don't choose to take action when we see those injustices happening that do actively cause others to suffer or die. And we're faced with that in a really critical way right now with the pandemic. And again, we also have the other pandemic that exists, which is 
systemic racism and we have to choose to act across all of those spaces and we have to hold our elected officials accountable for the policy decisions they either make or choose not to. Just as kind of a big call to action, would you, um, after somebody has listened to this podcast, should their first step be to look up demanding a just Tulsa? Should their first step be to write their city council person or look up who their city council person is? Like, what would be the first, like, three things that you would have somebody do after this conversation? Yeah, I think I would do um, a few things. One is check out 918won'twait.org and you can see what Demanding a Just Tulsa is working on and asking for there. That's really good and a good jumping off point for just kind of learning more, doing some of your research, to know what the policies are. And then also check out wearetulsa.org to learn more about what the United League for Social Action is calling for. And again, it's a good way to get a sense of what are we seeking in policing policy in Tulsa. And then yes, that next step after that is to then figure out who your city councilor is, um, tulsacouncil.org. You can find who that person is. Make sure you also, of course, are contacting the mayor's office as well. We do have a strong mayor form of government. Our city council can form policies, but our mayor also can make executive orders. And then start reaching out to them and pushing for the policies you see demanding a just Tulsa and the United League for Social Action asking for, because we really do need more voices and we need our elected officials to know that it's not just a few Tulsans asking for these changes, it's many of us. So I would strongly encourage people to take those actions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laura. Uh, thank you. This has been the Ascends at Boston Avenue Podcast. Our producer is Alicia Urban. Our theme music was composed and performed by Wyatt Smith. Boston Avenue United Methodist Church is a progressive historic church located in downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma. Please check out our social media for more information on what's going on at Boston Avenue UMC. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.